guide line. It's our plumb line. It's our post. And we believe, even when we don't believe your word, there is something inside of us that believes we need it. It's the craziest thing, God. Help us now. Teach us and show us what we don't have and what we need and gently correct us and faithfully grow us. We want our lives to be a a picture of Christ. We want our our hope to be in you. God, your word tells us that you'll give us sweet honey from the rock and the finest of wheat. Please now, I I ask you, Father, me, I, I ask you to take a coal from the fire of your altar and touch the top of my head and, and burn off my impure thoughts and my, my dumb stories, God. May it always be about you and, and your word above all things go forward because you're the only one that can change a life. I believe it and pray it in Christ Jesus. Amen. Today, uh, the word that, we, that goes forth today is what's called a warning. If you've been walking with the Lord more than 10 years, today's word is a warning. When I was reading this particular section of scripture, um, there's the, what pastors call the big three. The big three. This is one of the big three. At Calvary Chapel, we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse through scripture. But at Calvary Chapel, we believe that once you're in the hand of God, you're safe. Once you're in the hand of God, you're protected. Once you've surrendered your heart to the Lord... Nothing could touch you. That everything is Father filtered. However, God puts in His Scripture this message today that tells some, as the Word declares, don't use the grace of God for lascivious behavior. Don't use the grace of God as your excuse to sin. Be careful, for God is not mocked. What a man sows, this too shall he reap. Are you with me? For most of us, for most of you all, for me this is the warning. For some of you, you're new, you're less than 10 years saved, today will be a warning. Be careful. Don't let this happen to you. Because I've seen it happen to others. Seen what happen, you might be saying. Okay. Scripture. Chapter 6, verse 4, the book of Hebrews. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good Word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame." There is this thing in Christian circles called once saved, always saved. Are you once saved, always saved? Are you one of those once saved, always saved folks? Do you believe that you can lose your salvation? These are all the catchphrases in the Christian circles. Me, I personally, I'm a once saved, always saved guy. Too much in Scripture shows me that God's faithfulness and His strength endure through everything. However, God's smarter than I am. And he puts three times in Scripture, he puts these warnings. Be careful. Don't mess with God. Don't think you can come to church, smile, lift your hands, be anointed with the Holy Spirit, worship God with everything, and then go out there and do whatever you want to do. And then come back and boom, you're safe again. Be careful. He says here, for it is impossible. Now I want you to know something. And this is the caveat kind of thing. That word for impossible is not what they call in the Greek imperative. It's not imperative. It translated in another place means weak. That same word means weak. Now what he's saying, it's not totally impossible, but your chances are slim. And let me tell you why as a pastor I know that. I know many pastors who have stumbled in a pastor's position, they have, look at, the, look at what it says here. If you have enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, been partakers of the Holy Spirit, 
tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. This is not somebody who got saved last week, got saved a couple of years ago, went back into the world. This is not this person. Matter of fact, I was at the gym yesterday and I had a conversation with a brother and he was telling me, Ryan, I read something. I want, I want to show it to you. And he said he had listened to a pastor teach about how unless you love God, I'm sorry, he said unless you obey God, saying you love God doesn't do a thing for you. And he says, I'm in trouble, Ryan. I'm in trouble because I don't obey God. I don't obey God at all. I'm in trouble. And I said to him, my brother, if you thought you were safe, then you'd be in trouble. The fact that you think you're in trouble means you're safe. And he said, what are you you talking about? It's the heart that says, I'm cool, when you know you're doing things you shouldn't be. That is really in danger of hellfire. This scripture is not for him. This scripture is for those who, like myself, have been saved, been baptized by the Spirit, have seen God's power heal people, strengthen people, save people. I have tasted the heavenly gift. I've seen the prophetic word of God go forward and do the miraculous. If I allow myself to become weakened, have a little extramarital thing, maybe do a little business number that think God's cool with it, he says, be careful. That's the person who, once you've tasted all those things, and then you, well, see what he says there? Fall away. Fall away. Now listen, let me explain to you how this works practically. I have friends who are pastors in churches, ministers, evangelists, who have fallen away. And the vast majority of them, you know, it's not, it's not even the money thing. Uh, with some of them it is, but most of them it's the sex thing. I mean, let's just, truth be told, most of the biggest things they do is they, they wind up having sex with their secretary. They wind up having an extramarital affair. And, and, and the church is all too willing in their hope to bring people upon grace to just re-embrace them. Oh, yes, they, they repented. Let's just bring them back. They repented. Let's just bring them back. And you... You don't give them any kind of period of growth. You don't give them any kind of chance to let the Lord work on their heart. Let me tell you, I've seen these people, and it's hard for them. They, they spend the next period of their life stumbling and falling. and It's no joke. If anybody here has been a part of a church for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then I'm glad. And here's what I tell you. Don't let it happen to you. Get addicted to this word. Get addicted to church. Get addicted to ministry and let it last your whole life long. Because the saddest thing in the world is to see somebody who has been gifted with the gifting of of preaching or the power of evangelism or the gift of prophecy you see, the Bible says this, guys, and please stay with me. I know I'm going to go to some places where some of you guys are like, come on, make it applicable. It's going to be more than applicable. The Bible says that the calling and the gifts of God are irrevocable. Which means if God gives you the gift of prophecy, if God gives you the gift of speaking in tongues, if God gives you the gift of encouragement, any of the spiritual gifts, and there's lots of them, do you understand that He never takes them away? As a matter of fact, stay with me, please. This will comfort some of you. The gifts that are in you are already there literally from the beginning, some of them. The gift of spiritual discernment I've seen in little kids as young as five and six years old. They think the devil's out. The devil's trying to get me. What do you mean the devil's trying to get me? They see some TV show. They get a little spooked out by the devil. And little kids, five, six, seven, ten years old, oh, the devil's trying to get me. And their mom comes, oh, my goodness. My kid says the devil's trying to get him. What's the matter with him? And I say, nothing. He has the gift of spiritual discernment. He already is seeing things that most of us never see. He's already sensing things in the spiritual realm that most of us ever see. Now what we have to do 
is encourage it and bring it up. My daughter, Cammie, she, is, she has the gift of an encourager. The Bible calls that the gift of exhortation. She's six years old. Oh, Daddy, you did a good job fixing a car today. <laughs> Mommy, that was the best food I ever did eat. She already has it. Now, you can encourage it or you can discourage it. You could help what's physical become what's spiritual. You could recognize that the power of God is already upon her. The gifts of God. For instance, so this will hit some of you. I have the gift of discernment as well. I pick up little things. I read people's faces. I, uh, in the world, I think they call it paranoia. <laughs> But it was the gift that I had ever since I was young. You talk to somebody and you could look at them. You could sense something. You're mad at me. I could tell. Why you say that? I could tell you're mad at me. Anybody like that? You just know. You could see. I know you're, I know you're upset. I see it. I smell it on your spirit. You're upset with me. Now, in the church, that can be a wonderful gift. You could look in somebody's eyes and tell they have a broken heart. And you can encourage them. But let me tell you something. In the world... Even in the church, it can be torturous. Thinking people dislike you, thinking somebody hates you, knowing something, thinking and wondering when it's you. And they are swear, especially women. I swear there's nothing wrong. I'm telling you, I know there's something wrong. There's nothing wrong. Leave me alone. <laughs> then if there's nothing wrong, then why did you say it like that? Because I want you to leave me alone. <laughs> what did I do? It was three days ago, and you never apologized. I just asked you if there was something wrong. You said there was nothing wrong. <laughs> well, you're an idiot for not knowing. I knew it. I knew there was something wrong. You know what I'm talking about. It's that thing. When you've done that and seen that, God's gifts and callings are irrevocable. He doesn't take them back once he's finished. I know people that speak in tongues and they could even interpret. Credible gifts. Some of you guys that are a little older in the Lord know what I'm talking about. If you don't, if you have an interest in that stuff, just come and ask, her, ask us afterward. We'll lay hands on you. Maybe God has a certain gifts for you that he hasn't unlocked yet. However, you think you fall away and God would take them away. You think that that spiritual discernment, once you stumble and fall, God's going to like just, no, nope, that's it. Now I'm taking it back. God doesn't do that. That's never, that's never been God. He never takes away what he gives you. As a matter of fact, the only time God takes away anything from you, he gives it back better. Everything. So what does that mean? He even, Paul describes it, or whoever it is that wrote the book of Hebrews, he even describes it in the very physical sense for an agricultural society. He explains to them why and how. Watch what he says here. Picking up in verse 7, he says, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. He says the earth The rain comes down upon the earth and it bears herbs, food, vegetables, fruits that are useful. But, verse 8, if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. It says, just like the earth itself receives the receives the water, and in case you guys don't know, the Bible, the Word of God, is a type of water all through Scripture. It'll call the Bible the water of the Word. Just like a person receives the water of the Word, grows and bears fruit, helping others. That's what we're called to do. Love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and our neighbors, ourselves, the Lord Jesus said, right or wrong. Just like the earth, though. If the earth bears fruit, we love it, we use it, it helps us. But if the earth bears thorns and briars, anybody live in Florida and think you have a grass? No, no. Where it gets cold, they have grass. Up in New York, in the summertime, you can roll in the grass and it's soft and oh, you put your hand on it, your face on it. It's the greatest thing. In Florida, we have weeds. They just turn green sometimes. You guys know what I'm talking about? It says, but if the earth, if, if you plant a garden and instead of getting the fruit that you desired, you get thorns and thistles, you know what you do? You go to the store and you spray it down and you kill everything, till it, turn it over. It says, make that spiritual now. 
God pours all his light and all his love and all his goodness in you and you bear nothing but bad fruit, you take advantage of God's people, you steal, you rob, whatever, what do you think God's going to do? He's going to leave you to yourself. And let me tell you, <laughs> you'll do worse job to yourself than God ever would do. God takes his hand of protection off of you. Hey, we're not interested in God's protection anymore. Have it your way. How'd that work out for our school system since we stopped praying in school? And then they want to say, where was God at Columbine? Where was God at this? Where was God? Excuse me. God says, I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed. Where was God at Sandy Hook? Some great books and stories that just came out about seeing how God was at Sandy Hook. Not in the school, but in the hearts of those people who believe that he can take what was so foul and make it good still. Again, for the earth which drinks in the rain and often, that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be burned. That's what I do in my house. I cut down the bushes, the trees, I throw them in a big pile. You guys had to see what we did on Christmas, on New Year's Eve. My son dragged the tree out of the house with the light still on it. <laughs> Threw it in the street, set it on fire. I told him, look, you set that tree on fire, son, I'm not going to sit out here until 2 o'clock in the morning watching it burn with you. You're going to sit out here all by yourself. He said, let's do it anyway. How about it? So we threw some fireworks under the tree, set it on fire. Let me tell you something. I don't know, I, I don't know if I just don't remember it. In 90 seconds, the whole thing was burnt up with a blaze. It was, it was like, wow. And the heat coming off it and the cool colors from the plastic lights and everything. <laughs> it was phenomenal. I couldn't believe it. Totally separate. I mean, this is totally like a life lesson. I don't believe I'll be getting a live tree and putting it in my house again. I put a live tree in my house a couple of months ago. Well, actually, not even. About five or six weeks ago. I wrap electricity around it. It dies, and I say, please don't go on fire in my house. Something's missing here. Because if you would have seen that tree go up like I said, I was like, man, my house would have been toast. I would have been a marshmallow. Where was I? Oh, we burned it. So, yeah, that's what we did. So we cut the stuff down and we burned it. That's what you do with stuff that's unuseful. Boy, I don't want to hear that about, about my, some of my friends that have fallen away from the Lord after having tasted all those good things. I don't want to hear it. Now, I can mention names that you guys have known. I go, man, I don't want that guy to go to hell. But that's what's going to happen. And he says, it's hard, man. That word for impossible, it's like super, really tough, hard, very, very hard to really repent after you've fallen away. Again, I am not talking about, I would even suggest, unless you're 10 years old or more in the Lord, because there's just some things you can't experience unless there's time involved. Some things there. I talked about it last week. Some of us think, oh, I've been walking with the Lord eight years. Oh, so what you're saying is the Lord looks down and sees his eight-year-old. Oh, you're an eight-year-old. You, you have an eight-year-old. I'm a big boy now. Oh, you're a big boy now. Yes, you're a big boy now. You know what I'm talking about? We're not talking about that. We're not talking about some teenager some, from new believers. We're talking about somebody who has experienced these things. That's why he labors in this. He doesn't say, watch again, go back to verse 4. It is impossible for those who are once enlightened. It doesn't say that. It says, enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. You understand? I want you not to think, because the last thing I want you to do is, man, pastor said I was going to hell if I fall away. That's not it. That's not it. And he reiterates that too, continuing verse 13. Nine. I like that one even better. <laughs> but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love which you have shown toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. He's saying it very clearly. Please stay with me. He's saying, God doesn't forget what you've done. He doesn't forget. These things accompany salvation, yes. But God's not going to forget. It's not like if you did, you, you went out and you're serving at the, uh, at the convalescent home 
and then the next day you went out and got drunk and you woke up in somebody's house you didn't know and God, when you leave, he goes, I hate you. No, he's, that's, that's not, I suggest you don't do that. Believe me, it's not helpful for you. But that's not what we're talking about here. Just understand, he says, God, why am I, I'm laboring this because I don't want anybody to feel like they're condemned. It's not what we're talking about here. Verse 11, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. What are the promises? What is he talking about? He's telling them the warning first. The writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, it's impossible once you've really walked with the Lord, if you fall away to come back, it's impossible. But, but, that's not going to happen to you. I have greater hope. These things aren't going to happen to you. I have greater hope because you minister. I have greater hope because you're going to be diligent. I have greater hope because you're not going to become sluggish. I have greater hope that you're going to imitate those who through patience and faith have inherited the promises. Verse 13, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Give me your attention, let me explain to you. He says, You have a promise from God, and there's no one greater. He says this funny thing. He goes, man, I always swear. Oh, I swear, I swear, I swear, I swear, I swear. He says, what are you swearing? I swear on my bank account. I swear on my kids. I swear. People will swear on anything. He says, listen, God, when he made a promise, he swore by himself. You know why? Because there's nothing better. When he was blessing Abraham, Abraham did the same thing we do. Abraham heard the voice of God saying, come with me. Abraham was in Mesopotamia. Abraham was a heathen. He was a godless man from a godless family. He knew nothing about God. And God knocked on his heart and said, follow me. I'll take you to a place you'll be blessed. So much like us. He is such a picture of the Christian church, of the Christian. God calls you from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every race, every religion. He knocks on your heart and he says, follow me. Come with me. Let's do something together. Some of us, we have the personality that goes, well, i got to know where I'm going. You're going to heaven. What am I going to do before I get there? Lots. i got to know more. No, you don't. That's where the faith comes in. God calls you, and He says, come on, let's go to heaven. Well, what's going to happen before you get there? There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be trials and tribulation. There's going to be the mountaintop experience and the valley experience. You want to know everything before you get there? You want a road map? Yeah! That's not what happens. That's not how God works. God doesn't promise an easy flight. He only promises you a smooth landing. Is that okay? That's a question you've got to ask yourself. It really is. Because here he said, when he called Abraham, the first thing he said to Abraham is, I swear to me, I will bless you. I swear to me, everything that happens in your life will bless you. And in case you don't know the story of Abraham, how Abraham's wife was 90 years old and he had no kids, but God promised him he was going to have kids. In case you didn't know the story of Abraham, where Abraham's wife, before he had kids, was abducted by another king wanted to keep her as, a, as one of his concubine, but God promised him children. You can see all the promises that God made to Abraham, the same promises he makes to you. I promise you, your life will be blessed in the end. I promise you, you will be able to say all things have worked together for good for me. I promise you. And there's no one greater than God. And his promises never fail. Never. Well, you don't know because, no, don't give me hypotheticals. Don't give me your worries and your fears and your doubts. Give God your heart. He'll take care of everything. I was talking to my brother Walt before the service. The liberals, they have this crazy thing that they do. You know, me and Joey, last year we made this video of, of MMA and Christianity. 
And the first thing I said in the video was, you know, if you're not into MMA and you're not into Christianity, you're not going to get this video. You're not going to get it. But the correlation between mixed martial arts, anything that you do that brings you to the end of yourself and Christianity is so close. But there's Christians on there saying, don't believe this pastor's a charlatan. There's people making comments that you never think. They say this. And, and I said to the guy, I sent him a text. I couldn't handle it no more. This one guy who's got Jesus all over his page. and this, He said, this guy is using the Bible to this. God would never condone the punching of somebody in the face. He, he's got the whole thing there. And this guy, he doesn't know God at all. And I said, well, so what are you saying? Somebody who's an MMA fighter? He accepts Jesus, and what's he supposed to do? Is he supposed to just quit fighting uh, and get a job as a milkman? I mean, what is it that you can do in this world that isn't offending somebody? Because when it comes down to it, they're going to tell you you're bad for trying to make money. Money's bad. Money's not bad. Money's good. The love of money's bad. And what you will do to make that money, that's between you and God. And that's where God will judge you. But there's nothing wrong with making money. God wants you to make money. Now, we don't use God to make money. The Bible specifically says, don't use God as a, me as a means for gain. God wants you to be rich, work hard, and you'll be rich. God wants you to be poor, work hard, and you'll be more blessed in spirit than the guy that's rich. You won't miss it. The point I was making was it's, Wherever you are, let God have your heart and he'll make you better at it. If you're a house mom and you're looking at homeschooling your kids and you think, I was terrible in school. I can't homeschool my kids. Listen to me. You love Jesus with everything that's in you and he'll make you the best homeschool mom there ever was. You're an insurance salesman, computer fixer, whatever it is that it is you do. Don't you get it? If you love Jesus with everything, he'll make you better at it. We search and seek for everything that we think is going to make us better because there's this thing that's going on in our heart and our mind. Well, God doesn't like me because, you know, it's only the grace of God, that, especially for you guys that fight here. Especially for you guys that are involved in, in business. You've got to deal with the cities. You've got to deal with the states. You've got to deal with... So much confusion. You got to, this guy's got to get paid, and that guy's got to get paid, and this permit's got to get through. And there's always these gray areas, and you think, you know, God's going to be mad at me because I didn't do everything right. Listen, you do your best to do everything right. The Bible's clear about giving to Caesar what Caesar's and God was God, but don't you understand? God wants to use you right where you are. Yeah, let's, this is what we should do. Make all the MMA fighters stop being MMA fighters. All you guys, I'm looking at all you guys. Don't be MMA fighters anymore. Don't be Christian. Either, either be a Christian or don't be... Okay, the, then who do we have as an ambassador in the MMA world to save those that are going to hell that are there? Well, they can go to church. What do you mean they can go to church? Why would they go to church? To see a bunch of people who don't understand what they do nor care and tell them if you... You understand the principle? And this works in every phase of life, no matter what you're doing. Sports, arena, anything, especially motherhood. Moms, here's the crazy thing. My wife made a lot more money than I made when we first got together. As a matter of fact, her parents told her, he's a bum. <laughs> you know, marry somebody that's got at least something happening. He cleans up a warehouse for $5 an hour. And you know what she did over the course of the next five years? She gave up her job to raise our kids, even though I was making no money, because she faithfully believed that God was able to do what I wasn't. And things were tight. Things were tough. And there was many times where she said, maybe I should go back and start selling insurance again, because you ain't making no money, hon. You know, borrowed money from her parents, borrowed money from my parents at different times. $100 here, $50 there to get some groceries. But God, you can see I ain't missed no meals. <laughs> My kids, they're all alive. <laughs> Not one of them starved. 
God's been faithful, man. And He's able to do that where you are. Now, now look at what He says here. I love this last section of, of Scripture here. That, um, verse seven, 18. 17. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel confirmed by an oath. That big word, immutability, means unchanging. Not only is he making the oath, but his oath is immutable. It's unchanging. It will not fail. He says, verse 18, that by two immutable things in which that it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. I love that. We have fled from refuge for the hope. That's what I did. And although at the time I wouldn't admit it, I'll admit it now. I fled for refuge. I made a mess of my freaking life. And I fled for refuge to a living and loving God. And He filled me with a hope. It wasn't immediate. It wasn't automatic. It didn't, it didn't happen overnight. It was a spark. You know what it was? I'll show you what it was. Look at verse 19. This hope we have, ready? As an anchor of the soul. What a great verse. An anchor of the soul. Of the soul, both sure and steadfast. He will take you who don't know Jesus. He does it like that, and somehow he places in your soul an anchor. An anchor. If you've ever been boating and you're on the waves, which I hate, but you might like it. Mikey, you do you, what happens? You put that anchor down, boom, you stop drifting, don't you? You stop drifting once that anchor hits bottom. That's what he does. He puts an anchor in your soul. Yeah, it still might be a little rocky here and there, but you ain't drifting. He's keeping. I, I got him tied up. I got her. I got her on. I got her with an anchor in her soul. Both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. The presence behind the veil. Let me explain to you. This anchor goes into a place in your heart that you didn't even know was there. You knew it, but you didn't know it. Quick lesson. Here's where I'm going to bring it to a close in a few minutes. You who are new to God, new to Scripture, new to church, you are created a triune being. As God was the God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, so too you are a triune being. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. Understanding what I'm saying? There is something... Let me give it to you like this. You go into a bar, and if you're a guy, you see this really nice-looking girl there, and first thing you do is, you, man, that's a, man, that's a, that's a nice-looking lady right there. That's your flesh. You're trying to appeal to the flesh. You try to make yourself look good. You know, you got this thing here. You put a drink in your hand because you never know what to do with your hands before you got something in them. <laughs> you want to look cool. You are trying to appeal to this girl's flesh. That didn't work because you're ugly. I mean, I'm ugly. So you try to appeal to her soul. You know, I read the most amazing book the other day. I saw this TV show and it made me ponder the deeper things. You're now trying to entice her soul, her emotions. You're trying, to re- you're trying to appeal to something that you couldn't appeal to with the flesh, again, because you're ugly. <laughs> then that doesn't work, brother. So then, yeah, you want to get all spiritual. You know, I was in church the other day and pastor said something interesting. Now you're going to try to... There is this three different things. It's, there's that comedian on, on TV. He says, I have this thing in my head that I know is true and real, but then there's this other thing in my head that I know it's not real, but yet it's still there. You know what I'm talking about? You have this thing that goes on and you're sure that... It's like the first thing you think about when you... I don't know if women do this same thing, but guys do the same thing. You meet a girl, and the, some of us, the first thing that comes in her is the most foul, filthy, disgusting thought that pops in her head, and you're like, and you're like, wow, there's something wrong with me. No, actually, that's your flesh telling your spirit to do something it should not do. You are created a body, a soul, and a spirit. 
For instance, Chuck Smith put it this way in one of his books. You're driving your ATV in the desert. Bam, 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 bam. You're driving, you're having a good old time. And you're out about four or five miles and it breaks down. And you're in the middle of the desert. And it's 90 degrees, maybe 100 degrees. <sighs> you start to huffing back. About three or four hours into it, man, you're, you're thirsty. Your flesh is telling you you need something. Are you with me? Well, all of a sudden, I come by in my car, in my truck, in my four-wheel drive truck. Hey, it's Sean Joy. Bro, I saw your last fight. You're the best fighter in the world. I can't believe it, man. I'm so excited to meet you. I go through all these soulful stimulating, emotional stimulating things. And you know what he's like? Yeah, 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 yeah. Water. Water. Let's talk about me after you give me water. No, 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 man. I got to tell you, man. I, I want to be a fighter just like you. And you see the difference in the separation? However, there is something greater than the flesh. There's something greater than the emotions or the soul. It's your spirit. Your spirit's eternal. Your spirit is what connects with God when you receive Jesus Christ. Your spirit is what He puts in the presence behind the veil. That's where He puts that anchor when you receive Him so that you always know. So that you always know no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, if you run away from God or you stay close to God, the first thing He does, He puts that anchor in there. And you know what that anchor says to you? I love you! And you're like, man, people that receive Christ as Savior, it's like it's the craziest thing. It's like this whole weight fell off my shoulders. Yes, that's the Spirit of the living God. That's the anchor that goes in the presence behind the veil that keeps you sure and strong. Are you understanding me? This hope we have is an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. The Holy Spirit says, I love you! And then you leave church. And Monday, I love you. And Tuesday, I love you. Wednesday, you don't have time for church. I love you. By Friday, the, vo the voice, is, it's faint. And you're like, man, did I lose my anchor or something like that? You come back on Sunday and you hear the worship go forward. You see the prayer. You hear the word go forward and you go, and you hear it again. I love you. Yes, God loves me. That's that anchor. It's like, it's like a cordless speaker that he puts in your spirit. But some, and he goes back again, going back to the first warning. You fall away. You run away from God. And that voice that was once so loud and you knew it and you felt it and you're sure it was there, now all of a sudden it's non-existent. It's so faint. So many times we pursue our things, is what I was talking about before, we pursue our things that we're sure God doesn't approve of. Not realizing, not only does God give you that good desire in your heart, He not only approves of it, He wants to make you better at it. But we, we don't, I've got no time for God. God don't have no time for me. He doesn't, God's not happy with me right now because I'm doing this or I'm doing that. We think. God says, are you kidding me? Not only do I approve, I put you there. Are you with me? Lastly, verse 20. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become the high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Next week, we're going to look at this high priest Melchizedek. Leah, would you come up and play something? Where's Leah? She's what? She's sir. Leah is? Praise God. Will you come up and play something then? I want to give you an opportunity to receive this anchor behind the veil, this presence of the soul and this soul if you are in any place where the things that I'm saying today have caught you by, by a hurricane, they slapped you right in the face, and there's this question, this wondering, am I serious? If... 
If I assume that you have no idea what I'm talking about, let me start from the beginning. Christian that's here, I know we've gone long. This is important stuff. This is what everything comes down to. It's not the band playing or me talking. It's somebody who, who's been touched by the Spirit of God who needs to receive Him, who needs to know that there's a God who forgives them. For when God puts that anchor in your soul, there's no, there's no more, there's no more doubt. You knew something happened. You've lived your life, and people have hurt you. Your family has not done what you thought they should, so you've dived, you've dove into your business. You dove into your relationships. You dove into your sin. And you just found out that it didn't satisfy like you thought it would. You thought what was your freedom became your bondage. You thought you were going to get somewhere and the only way you got was miserable. If you've come to the end of yourself, I offer you that are here hearing my voice by the power of the Word of God, salvation. God has put His Son on a cross to die because you owe a debt you cannot pay. There's no... And you know it. You know you've been running from God your whole life because you knew you were doing things that He wouldn't approve of. You either said you didn't believe in God or didn't care. Well, now it's time. Your heart stops beating and you go before a living and loving God and there's only one thing that's going to stop you from serving the sentence of your soul, which is hell. And that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. Because heaven's free. No more debt, no more pay. You're on trial. And the lawyer is the devil. And the judge is God. And he says, I have commandments and you must keep them. Thou shalt not commit adultery, lie, steal, bear false witness. Thou shalt not. And you think about them in your, in your life and you're like... Psh. And the devil's sitting on the side of the table. You guys have that picture in your head of the court. And he's sitting there going, he did this, and he did this, and he did this, or she did this, or she did this, or she did this. And you know you're guilty. And the judge is sitting on his high throne, and he's about to pronounce sentence on you. And they get to the last page of your conviction. And it says... told Jesus he loved him January 5th, 2014 and told Jesus that he wanted to follow him told Jesus he knew he was a sinner she knew she was a sinner told Jesus and the devil tried to keep that page hidden in secret because just maybe some of you guys did this already and you haven't been walking but that page couldn't be hidden because that's the first thing that was played up on the wall. Boom. Salvation. And the devil says, well, what about the lies and the cheating and the... <laughs> I'm sorry. That debt's canceled. I'm sorry. Those chains are broken. Come on in, daughter. Come on in. Come on in, daughter. And you look... And you say you know all that I've done already? I know. You know even the things that I thought that are so hard. I know. Then why would you forgive me? Because I love you. you know, what do you mean you love me? I love you. The Bible says that he loved you first. That you wouldn't be here in church today if it wasn't the fact that he first set his love upon you. Guys, 
I am a brand plucked from the fire. You might be like me. Nobody in my family knows Jesus. I don't know why God looked down from heaven before all the creation and decided that in 1965 I was going to be born and he was going to love me. I don't know if it's some Catholic grandma praying for me somewhere in Italy or somewhere in Russia. I have no idea. But somewhere God decided you were going to be his. And it's nothing you did to deserve it. You just got it. Confirm it today. I'm going to lead you in a prayer that's going to say, I'm going to give you the words. Just say it out loud after me. It's just a dedication prayer. You're just saying, God, I love you. And I need your forgiveness. And God will give you immediately the anchor boom behind the presence of the veil and from this day forth God will begin a work in you that only he can complete you can't do nothing listen the greatest thing about accepting Christ as Savior you know what you have to do afterward nothing zero just let him change your life just let him for every step you take to God he takes ten to you Okay, I've talked long enough. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit work a second. I'm going to ask the church to pray. And I'm going to ask you to think about what I just said. You who know exactly who I'm talking to. Alex, give me about a minute, please. Just play a song. A thousand times I fail. And still your mercy remains. Sure I stumble again I'm caught in your grace Everlasting Your light will shine When all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond all things My heart and my soul I give you control Consume me from the inside out Lord Let justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the inside out You will above all us my purpose remains The art of losing myself In bringing you praise Everlasting Your light will shine When all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond all something you know you need to do I want you to stand up congratulations brother. I want you to stand up if it's something you know you need to do it you've been waiting too long it's something you're going to stand up in front of everybody you're not going to be afraid because he died on a cross in public and you're going to do it you're going to say God I'm yours this time I mean it don't let anything keep you down this is your commitment between you and God and you just don't care who knows it Let it go. This world holds nothing. The power of this world will not give you what you desire. It's time to let fear go. You 
know this is why you were called. day. I swear I will. You know who I'm talking to. Don't let it burn you no more. It's raining outside anyway. Listen to it. You ain't going nowhere. else that wants to make a stand for the Lord and just make it a firm commitment whether it's the, it doesn't matter if it's if it's something you've already done it just if you just want to recommit your ways to the Lord the Bible says commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established don't be afraid relationship with a man or a woman how many times have you apologized and promised I knew you were going to screw up again but how many times have you apologized to your wife baby I'm really sorry I'm never going to do that again yet you do it again it's okay to do it with God God who is more graceful than our wives more graceful than your husband it's okay to say I'm sorry God forgive me and this time I mean it it's okay I think there's not a woman in here that wouldn't say, I'd rather him apologize and not mean it than not apologize at all. I know, I know every man would say that, that I know. Okay. Ten more seconds, and then the kingdom of, here you go, brother. The kingdom of heaven will close, the gates will close, and nobody else will be allowed in. Well, that did it. There you go. Uh, that, that part was a lie. I'm sorry. Yes, Mickey. Yes. yes. Hey, let's say this prayer out loud together. And um, don't say it if you don't mean it, but mean it and say it. Say it with me. And just listen to the words before you say them. Don't just parrot them. Because this is the word of God we're going to speak. And a positive confession we're going to make to God that will change our lives. Out loud say, Dear God, I open my heart and I let you inside to do your work, to have your will, walking your way. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me clean. I have decided this day that your plan is best for me. My plan has not worked. And I'm ready. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Now, you that might have stood up for the first time and you're just like, okay, now what? We want to help you to find out what God's plan is for your life because his plan is a great plan. We're going to have our leadership team up here. Ladies, see a lady. 
brothers see a brother. Guys, come on up. Leadership, come on up now. Have a blessed, blessed rest of your weekend. And let what God did in your heart today really, really take deep root. Let that anchor that, that's in the presence of your soul, let it be heavy in your spirit every single day. It's a beautiful heaviness.